And this is your election headquarters, uh, the Joy News Channel on Multi TV. Now, with 41 days to go to election 2016, what has arguably been the plague of the past four years is back on the front burner for discussion, be it politics or a search for solutions. I'm talking about access to uninterrupted power supply in your homes and in your offices. In the past 24 hours, the two main political parties have been adducing reasons for the provision or the lack of electricity. Well, the opposition New Patriotic Party argues that the power we enjoy today is only to whet our appetites to vote for the governing party and not a true end to the accepted word in Ghanaian lexicon, Dumso. Policy advisor to Naneku Faru Bwachejak warns we could be back to the dark days of more than 24 hours without light if Ghana re-elects President John Mahama. However well intended a program or a project is, however well intended it is, if it is causing consternation, upheavals, and threatens social dislocation, it is the responsibility of authorities, governments, to look at it again. Because you see, in every project or program, however well intentioned, there will be winners and losers. And one has to be careful not to simply ride rough short over the loser in expectation that it is good, therefore, it must happen. It is our intention that post the announcement of the Compact II, there's been a lot of agitation and anxiety in our society. Civil society organizations commenting on it, workers commenting on it, the general public not sure whether this is going to raise their tariffs or not. It is our intention that in order to move forward on the compact, we need to bring back the stakeholders and do a comprehensive review so that we can find a way forward. It may mean that there, there will have to be changes in the compact. It may mean that the compact will have to admit to further guarantees to, to workers. It may mean that through provision of adequate information, those who feel an angst or anxiety will now have adequate information to understand that there is no threat, and therefore the compact can proceed as is. For us, that review on both sides is necessary so that there can be a common understanding on how to move the project forward. Sometimes there is a way you compensate losers in order for them to admit to moving forward. So we will do a comprehensive review and see how the project is going to move forward. Are you able to speak to any specifics for now? No, I wouldn't want to because you haven't met all the stakeholders. But um, you've enumerated a lot of um, challenges facing um, the power sector in Ghana. And um, some experts say one of the ways that we can, one of the lifelines to the challenges that you have enumerated is to, you know, give the ECG, the electricity company of Ghana, to, I mean, to a private com company, seek part of it to a private company. And that would increase efficiency, increase supervision, and all of that. That is a possibility. First of all, don't forget that in the history of ECG, the route you recommend has been tried twice. First with an Irish company, and secondly with a French company. They didn't make any headway. So it is not as if that method has not been tried before. It's been tried twice. There has also been a period in the history of ECG when it was under the leadership of Mr. Kalechi that ECG performed extremely well. So there you are. Ghanaian management at a point in time have done well. Foreign consultants and foreign manage, managers have also come and have not done well. So it is not that simple. But ask yourself, what are the problems with ECG? Of course, they have management problems. They haven't been provided with a good board for a long time. Admit to that. 
But if government owes ECG 900 million cities and is not able to pay, how is ECG to perform? The more fundamental question one ought to ask is that if you bring in a private owner or a private concessionaire, does it mean that the 900 million debt is now going to be paid or is now going to be ring-fenced off the books of records of ECG so that the private concessionaire takes a clean slate and not the debt. Now, if you are going to do that for the private concessionaire, why aren't you doing it for the local managers? The first thing government has to do is to fess up and pay. Any company that has uncollected debts of 900 million cannot pay for. So that's what Jack was speaking rather on uh, the MPP's moves to review the Millennium Challenge Compact that has been signed and also talking about how we can deal with our debt situation when it comes to the power sector. Let's now hear the MPP's own solution to the power crisis we have in the country today. Now, you, you, you've mentioned a lot of, um, I mean, things that we're going through as a country, especially in the energy sector. What solutions are you preferring to um, the numerous and countless um, troubles that you have um, listed here today? Well, we, we've, we've looked at the, the, the pro problems and we've, we've recommended a number of solutions in our man manifesto. The first is to make sure that the sector is competently led, both from the regulatory, from the ministerial, and from the sector participants, i.e. ECG, Gridco, and the power producer, generation capacity transfer. We have to make sure that there is a competent leadership in all places. The second thing is to tackle the financial crisis that has been imposed on the sector. It's a merry-go-round. Why is it a merry-go-round? Government owes ECG. Therefore, ECG cannot pay the tra power transmitter, which is Gridco. Gridco cannot pay the power generators, VRA, and the independent power producers. And because they have not been paid, they cannot pay for, pay for crude oil supplies. So the fundamental nexus to this problem is government's inability to pay. Now, if government paid all its bills, right, this debt, merry-go-round debt, wouldn't exist. Procurement of assets in the power sector. How is it that our next do door neighbor, same geography and all, they produce power at nine cents a kilowatt hour, and we produce power from between 14 and 19 cents a kilowatt hour. It is, it, it is an indication of an inefficiency in that's, what the, in that's, that's why government wants to bring MIDA in to competently well, manage it. No, MIDA, that portion is the distribution portion. Hmm. Let's start from the generation portion. Of course, uh, 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 VRA, which produces 73% of all the power in Ghana, is largely a hydro project. We've run down our hydro resources. So we can no longer count on the dam system to support our energy requirements. We are now shifting to thermal and renewables. But if you procure thermal power at exorbitant prices underpinned by corrupt procurement, it means that your cost of production or operation already is high. Here you are. AmeriPower is going to cost this country a total of 1.3 billion a year to, to generate 250 megawatts. There is also the clause that even, and we are supposed to provide them gas, they don't take any fuel risk. So in the event that Ghana is unable to pro provide gas for them, we still pay them $10 million for not producing. 
And Mary is going to give us 250 megawatts of power for 1.3 billion. Qatar, Abu Dhabi, and Egypt have all spent $1.3 billion each and are getting 1,800 megawatts of power. Where did we go wrong? Where did we go wrong? It is as if you walk into a, a shop, your shirt is $20 or 20 cities, and I walk in and the same shirt, same exact shirt, you are telling me is 1,200 cities and I buy it. Where did I go wrong? So the procurement systems or practices in the energy sector is leading to high costs of tariffs. Then also here you have a government that is imposed all kinds of taxes on consumption of electricity in this day and age. We have to bring those taxes down. Again, security of fuel. Right now, look at what's happening with, with Nigeria gas and WAPCO. We can't pay, therefore they don't give us gas. They're supplying gas to Benin, they're supplying gas to Togo. We owe 160 million, we can't pay, they've turned us off. We have to make better secured arrangements so that these entities can go out and buy their fuels. Another thing we intend to do is introduce an energy mix that is more oriented towards renewables. Because the renewables is the future. Why is it that all government buildings and facilities cannot be put on solar panels? so that we take it off the national grid and so that the electricity bills of, of, of government comes down. Indeed, in certain countries, people generate power from their solar panels and sell it to electricity company. It's called reverse flow and billing. So those are the kinds of things that we intend to do immediately to make sure that the, the, the sector is returned to health and sanity. Right, so that's uh, Boache Jakun. He's a policy advisor to the MPP's uh, flag burner, Naradankwa Akufu Ado. Make of it what you will, what the solutions are to a power crisis by the MPP. But we also know that for players in the industry, they have concerns about the growing debt that we're building up in that sector. Former VRH Chief Executive Officer Kukwa Uche explains that we may need to pay some more attention to our debt. Otherwise, the doomsaw will come back in full force. Today, um, we currently have a generation uh, capacity of almost 3,500 megawatts, if not more. The country is currently using around 2,000 megawatts, and we know that part of the reason for that number is the, the emergency plants that have come in over the last, say, six months. But as I'm sure many of you will attest, uh, we still have large sections of the population suffering doom so for different reasons. I mean, call it what you want. It's, it's much better than it was a year ago, perhaps. But we're not in a sustainable place. And there are you know, various reasons for that. But I would argue that the biggest reason is a financial one, because there are so many debts that the state actors owe. Uh, VRA, ECG, Gridco, um, there's easily $2 billion of debts owed by various entities. And if uh, VRA is not paying uh, the Nigerians, WAPCO, they owe them $180 million. If VRA owes Ghana Gas $350 million, how long can that go on for? And I think the real issue is, what is the plan to address that? Because that 180 will become something else if unaddressed. Um, if, if those debts are not paid for, uh, we will have problems down the line. I mean, one of the reasons why you know, the Ghana Association of Bankers went to government to cut a deal, you know, VRA owed them 500 million, and it was affecting the banking sector. So they came up with a solution. Now, there's still debts owed to other people, uh, the suppliers, Saharas, the gas suppliers, the fuel suppliers. How are they going to supply us gas or crude oil if we haven't paid our bills? So 
I would say it's not sustainable if we don't pay our bills. So that's for the issue of power today. Let's now move on to other issues. We know that the man in the background, as you can see, uh, Pastor Osu Bempa, was uh, invited by the Police Criminal Investigation Department to answer some questions in, relating, uh, in relation to uh, prophecies he's made in the past about a possible assassination of uh, the flag brother of the MPP, Nanadu Dankwe Kufaro. That prompted the CID to have him come and explain to them what kind of prophecy he had seen and some more details. Well, this invitation uh, drew the ire of some supporters of um, Pastor Usu Benpa, and as you can see, many of his followers made it to the CID today to lend their support. Uh, in, in your shot now are many of his followers plus uh, his lawyer, Yao Buabinga uh, Samwa, who went there on his behalf to ensure that all legal issues are dealt with at the police CID. Well, um, what happened inside is a matter of interrogation. But outside, there were issues of his supporters who were thrown the, the police CID being allegedly assaulted. By whom the alleged the police, but we can we can uh, bring you some of the highlights of the supporters and what they had to say about what they call abuse at the hands of some police officers. <laughs> So, th so those are scenes from the police CID headquarters where uh, Pastor Subempa was interrogated and you, as you saw him there leaving his vehicle with the supporters actually around him in their numbers. Well, his lawyer, Yabwami Asamwa, shared a few words with the news team after the interrogation was done. Dr. Isaac Ousubempa was invited by the police to give them some advice on how to proceed on some of the revelations he's been having. He has proffered what advice he can give, and now we are on our way back home. He is safe, he is sound, and nothing has happened to him. As we speak now, as we speak now, as we speak now, Apostle Dr. Isaac Ousubempa is a totally free man. He was never under arrest. I want to make it clear. I want to make it clear. I want to make it clear that Apostle Dr. Isaac Ousubempa was never under arrest. This was a totally friendly visit, and we are happy it's over. So that's the lawyer for uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's the lawyer for um, Apostle Osu Bempa there uh, today speaking after the interrogation was done by the police CID. Now, still with politics today, a story you are likely to be familiar with, one that ended with the disqualification of as many as 12 presidential aspirants. Some have had their dare in court with others yet to. Well, one of them had his day today. I'm talking about the APC, All People Congress's uh, Hassan Ayarega. Apart from the brief court proceedings, that was the focus uh, for many. Mr. Ayarega was also explaining what he, what he believes to be uh, his disqualification having something to do with the NCCE. But let's first get details of what happened in the courtroom. Joseph Akable joins me in, in the studio. He covered that for us for joining us. Joseph, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Francis. So what happened in the courtroom today? It um, was quite a brief uh, session today. Uh, when they arrived in the court, the judge, uh, presiding judge, uh, Barbara Tetechawi, uh, she says she has decided on her own 
with the PPP case when they went to court, they, what the judge did was that the EC had brought an application asking that the matter be heard earlier than the usual time. Now, in this case, the judge is saying that on her own, she has decided that the matter ought to be heard early uh, because of the directive from the chief justice saying that it should give priority to electoral disputes. So because of that, she has decided that both parties should submit their statement of case by Friday after which they are to present oral arguments in court on Monday. Okay. And uh, in all of this, what was the demeanor of um, Mr. Yarega? In fact, he came in a company of uh, his running mate, uh, Emmanuel Carl Battles. Uh, he was very calm, not giving away too many emotions. It appears he's still waiting for the matter to be heard fully and hoping uh, for a ruling in his favor. He came calmly in their company. He sat down in court. He didn't come so early. He came just some few minutes after 9 a.m., sat down. Then right after the proceedings, he exited and spoke to so us. So there were no positions or statements made by the lawyers for the EC and the APC in the courtroom today? In actual sense, none of them even rose up. And when the judge finished speaking, uh, she allowed them whether they had any comments to pass. All the lawyers remained seated. No one even stood up to speak. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, but for Mr. Sayariga, yes, he may not have said uh, anything in relation to this case, but he's taking a new tangent on this matter, talking about someone else to blame for his disqualification. He's talking about the NCC, and uh, he makes the point that this is a body that at a point in time was chaired by the current EC uh, chair, Madame Charlotte Osei, and he says that body is supposed to carry out education of citizens in terms of issues relating to their responsibilities as well as electoral matters, and he says if they had carried out that responsibility diligently, citizens will be aware of what they are supposed to do, and they will not go around and be endorsing uh, the forms of more than one nominee. All right, let's hear from Mr. Yarega now. I am coming from PNC, and there are members of the PNC that have moved from the PNC to ignorantly use common mistakes. But it is the duty of the NCCE to have educated the people on how and how, how to subscribe. So for us, that fault does not lie on political, it lies with the NCCE boss, which was formerly the, Madame Charlotte Olesposé was the former boss of the NCC. Today, she is the EC boss. So if those common mistakes are happening, then it means that the boss, he didn't do the good job. So we think that is ignorant and that could not be a cause or it could be a cause for us to be as an NCT boss. It is your duty to educate the electorate on how to vote, what to do and what not to do. Right, so that's uh, Hassan Ayaga speaking. They're blaming uh, the NCCE and in fact he finds a way of tailoring it to the uh, EC boss who was the former boss of the NCCE. Madam Charlotte Osai. So, Joseph, Friday, where they are presenting their written arguments, and on mm -hmm. Monday, they make those arguments in open court. Okay. We also know that for the disqualified candidates, one of them's case is also being heard tomorrow. Uh, that is that of the NDP, Nana Konedu Ajiman Rollins. In fact, uh, tomorrow will be the day where the two lawyers will come to to and crossfire, like we saw yesterday <laughs> during the PPP case. And we are talking about Ace Ankuma, and as well as that is for NDP, and for uh, the EC, Tadio Sorry will be up again. That's one to look out for, but thank you, Joseph. I'm sure he will have uh, his good time in court uh, watching proceedings and sending us the information as he will. Thank you, Joseph, for those details. Now, the struggle for votes in the eastern region by the NDC and the MPP is becoming keen by the day as both parties endeavor to undo each other in the region. While the wife of the vice presidential candidate of the MPP, Samira Baumia, has commenced a campaign in the eastern region concurrently with the president. Interestingly, Samira Baumia is campaigning in some constituency the president have already visited or will be visiting. Early this morning, Samira Baumia commenced her campaign in, for the MPP in the Kande constituency. She called on the Muslim community to rally behind the MPP because uh, her party has good plans to develop human and infrastructure uh, in the Zongo community. She donated some 50 bags of cement to the Assum Islamic Primary and Junior High Schools uh, to rehabilitate their dilapidated school building. Maxwell Kudeko is with uh, Samira Baumia's team and joins us now online with more on this campaign. Uh, we will bring you, well, Maxwell will join us in just a moment, but let's hear from Samira Baumia herself speaking to uh, those in the Zongo communities in Kade today. <laughs> Yeah. 
Let's now bring you an update from uh, Max Okidako. He's our Eastern Regional uh, correspondent following Samira Balmi in the Eastern Region. Uh, Max, well, good afternoon to you. Where is she now and uh, what's been the biggest talking point about her campaign today? Well, she's currently at the Akutia constituency. She was supposed to pay a KTC call at the Zongo Street and then also address a mini rally at the Akutia Zongo. But when we got there, it started raining heavily, so we at currently uh, waiting for the rain to come down before she commenced the, 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 the campaign. Okay. I've been speaking with some uh, residents in the Zongo community and they disclosed to me that, yes, uh, the Zongo community uh, will change this election because they claim to have seen that the MPP are proposing more proactive policies to develop the Zongo community. As I reported earlier, uh, Mrs. Uh, Al 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 Adia Samira Baumia has been shaping interest from the Zongo electorate to rally behind the NPP. She talked about the Zongo Development Fund and what have you. She said that, yes, the uh, president has been talking about infrastructure development and what have you, but Throughout her tour in the eastern region, she realized that the eastern region still has issues uh, with roads. So she wondered if the president claimed to have fixed most of the roads, why would he be using helicopter to tour the region? So she asked the people to ignore the president and then also support the NPP massively. She also advised them to. Uh, be wary and be careful not to be induced by the NDC. She alleged that the NDC have started sharing goodies and monies and what have you. So when they come to the electorate, they should take the goodies because it's a taxpayer's money, but remember the interest of the masses. Uh, so briefly, this is what she's been talking about. We're waiting to hear what she will say uh, next at the Akotia Zongo community. All right. Thank you, Maxwell uh, Kodeko, for that update from the eastern region. That's uh, Samira Baumia, the wife of the MPP running, made busy in that region. Well, speaking of the eastern region, the president, John Mahama, is also busy campaigning. In fact, we know he's been to Fantiaqua today. Let's get more from Kofi Siao, a man following him in the region. Kofi, good afternoon to you. Where's the president now? What has he been talking about? Hello? Kofi, good afternoon to you. I'm asking where the president is as we speak and what's he been talking about? Well, currently, the president is in, and you know, in the Etuwa East constituency uh, of the Eastern Region. He's been meeting with the party people here, and he's trying to convince them and tell them why they should vote for him to retain him in power. Uh, first of all, in the morning, he's been to uh, Fantiaqua, uh, not uh, precisely the Ahuma Humaso uh, community where he also held a mini rally. Uh, he spoke to the people there and told them the reason why they should retain him in power. There he told them that, uh, that most of the development projects that are taking place in the Pantiaqua area was done by the NDC, especially when President Rollins was in power. 
Uh, he talked about the construction of roads, uh, the major roads from uh, Osiem to Begro, and he also spoke about the, the road from Begro to Ahumahuma. So he, he, he spoke about a lot of the road infrastructure the, that uh, the NDC uh, did for the people of uh, Fantiakwa. Uh, he said that when the people are able to vote for President Mahama to retain him in power, uh, he's going to construct three more major roads in the area, and that is going to be part of the phase two of the Coco syndicated uh, road project that the president is undertaking or the government is undertaking nationwide, and which includes the eastern region. So uh, he spoke about the rehabilitation of the Osiem uh, Begro Road and also talked about the one from Begro to Asete Ewa. So, hello? Yes, I can hear you, Kofi. The one from Begro to Asetewa. So uh, he spoke a lot about agriculture too. And from here, uh, that is Eminem. He is expected to speak to the people and tell them why they should vote for him and retain him. But for now, Omane Buama, who is the communication minister, is the one speaking now. And he says that NPP cannot be trusted uh, to reduce tax as they claim. Because in 1998, they imposed the introduction of tax on goods and services. But when they came to power, uh, they expected that it, they either maintain it or cut it off at all. But when they came to power, they rather increased the tax. So they cannot be trusted. Their tax records show that they cannot be trusted uh, to reduce the tax uh, system in the country. So uh, currently, we are here in Enyinam and expecting the president to speak. Okay, thank you, Kofi, for that update from the Eastern Region. Uh, the president busy in you know, Yenem. We'll get you more reactions and updates from that part of the country. But let's quickly go to the Volta Region now, where uh, the MPP flag burner, and Dr. Kufwadi, is also busy. Uh, with just 41 days to go busy, canvassing as many votes as he can before December 7. Let's get an update now from Ivy Setoji. She's following uh, the MPP flag burner. Ivy, West Nanado now, what's he been talking about today? Good afternoon. Nanado just talked to Pata uh, in the Nkwanta North District. And what has he been talking about in that area? Well, he just got here. He's yet to speak to the people. Uh, but when we were at Krati, um at the market, uh, Nana indicated that Ghanaians have the opportunity this year to read the country of President Mohammed's bad government. Uh, it's because of his poor policies, which have resulted in the rising cost of business, rising cost of, uh, and collapse of the health insurance scheme, according to him. He said his government, he assured, is coming to introduce policies which will ensure that market women can trade, make profits, and cater for their own. He also said his government will revive the collapse and the, the heavy. Hello? Hello? Yes, Ivy, I can hear you. Yeah, so he said his government will revive the collapse and the, 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 health, yeah, the health insurance scheme. That was what he said at the market. And what has been the reaction uh, of those in the region to uh, the comments he's been what? making? Hello, Francis. Ivy, I'm asking what the reaction of the people have been to his message in that part of the country. Well, the people, uh, the crowd was, was huge. Uh, it was a big crowd at the practice. The people said, okay, fine. They, they also want to try Nana uh, Kukwadu to see what he will do when he comes to power. Uh, so uh, many people we spoke to were happy that he was able to visit uh, that area and speak to them. All right. Uh, thank you, Ivy, for that update uh, from the Volta region. We know that we're just 41 days to go. The campaign is beginning to heat up a lot more than usual. We'll bring you everything you need to know about what's happening in the country in relation to the upcoming elections here on your election headquarters. And speaking about that, the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Charlotte, to say, has been promising uh, to conduct free, fair, and credible elections on December 7th. She was speaking when, when addressing the Asantikene in the Ashanti region. The political parties by Friday are going to get a list of all the polling stations in every region. 
the list would also be on the website of the Electoral Commission so that there's a higher level of transparency and everyone knows where the polling stations are. We are also sharing the polling station list with the security agencies ahead of time. The political parties would get, um, they should have had it by now, but we're having a few technical challenges. But at least by next week, all of them who have brought their hard drives would have a list of the final voters register. As you are aware, Nana, there's been a lot of concerns about the register. We've worked with the political parties, we've worked with the judiciary, um, we've worked through the exhibition process, we've cleaned up the register, we have deleted the names of people who registered with NHIS numbers. And those who wanted, about 29,000 of them took the opportunity to re-register. We have gone through the challenges and the objections to names on the register. We have received the final rulings from the magistrates and the district review officers. And so the register has now been finalized. We have implemented all the decisions and we're in a good place. And so they will have the register at the end of this week. Right then, so uh, that's the promise by the chairperson of the, of the Electoral Commission, Madam Charlotte Osei.